بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Continuing with our journey through Umdut al-Fiqh of Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqdasi rahimahu Allah ta'ala Tayyib, today the Imam he speaks about Abab al-Aniyya the chapter pertaining to vessels Why after talking about the different classic- classifications of water and how water is used to remove impurities is the Imam now talking about vessels Why? Because where is water normally kept? In vessels, right? So now we know to, need to know which type of vessels we can use, what is pure from vessels, what is impure, okay? Because you want to ensure that the water that you use it is kept pure. So the Imam, he's talking about vessels. He says, It's not allowed for you to use vessels which are made from gold or silver, okay? Whether that is in purification or other than purification, okay? لِقَوْلِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم Due to the statement of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in Bukhari لَا تَشْرَبُوا فِي آنِيَةِ الذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا فِي صُحَافِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَكُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ Do not drink in the vessels made from gold and silver and do not eat in their trays trays made from gold and silver for verily it is for them in this dunya meaning the non-Muslims and for you in the akhirah so the hadith is very clear that you are not allowed to eat or drink from vessels made of gold or silver. Very good, okay? The ulama, they mentioned the majority of the ulama, as mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Aziz uh, Ibn Jibreen in his explanations of this book, and Imam al Bahuti in his uh, explanation of Al Qina, okay? Khashf al Qina. He mentions that the Prophet ﷺ here mentioned the most uh, the thing which is mostly used for gold and silver vessels are mostly used for making uh, for, for drinking from or eating from but it's not mentioned in the way of restriction so the hadith is not restricting to just the usage of drinking and eating rather it's a blanket prohibition you cannot use gold and silver for any use therefore I cannot have a phone covering which is made of gold or silver Therefore, I cannot have taps which are made from gold or silver. I cannot have anything in the house which I'm going to use made from gold or silver, okay? This is the opinion of the majority of the ulama. Also, the ulama, they say, not only is isti'mal, isti'mal means using, is prohibited, but also ittikhad. Ittikhad means to take it as zina, for example, to leave it around the house, just as some form of beautification, or even just to have it as a collection. Of an item. They say as a rule, ما لا يجوز استعماله لا يجوز اتخاذه. ما لا يجوز استعماله that which you are not allowed to use لا يجوز اتخاذه. You are then not allowed to keep. Why? It's known as sad al dhiraya. Okay, the blocking of the pathways that lead to evil. The blocking of the pathways which lead to haram. So it's haram for us to use it, but having it around in the house, even if we don't use it can lead to you ending up using it or somebody ends up using it. So the Sharia in its mercy for us not only tells us that you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z, it blocks the means to X, Y, and Z. وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina. Don't even come close to zina. Don't, not just do zina. Don't come close to it. Don't take any of its pathways. Okay? So this is the blocking of the pathway. Sad ad Okay? Some exceptions. Women are allowed, obviously, to use gold and silver as adornment, okay? But don't tell them that unless you have a huge bank account. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in Nisa'i, as collected by Imam Nisa'i, he held up in one hand uh, harir, silk, and in the other hand, he held up gold. He said, هَذَيْنِ حَرَامٌ عَلَى ذُكُورِ أُمَّتِي These two are forbidden upon the male of my ummah, which means that it's allowed for the female of the ummah, right? And also men are allowed to use a particular type of ring because in Bukhari Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu narrates that اتخذ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خاتما من فضة that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم took for himself a ring from silver فاتخذ الناس خواتيم الفضة so people they copied the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and they took rings of silver but this cannot be done for the sake of following the fashion of the non-Muslims or the fashion of those who are extravagant and foolish Okay, it should rather be done with the intention of following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That is the best of intentions. Also, pertaining to gold and silver usage, that which is gold-plated 
has to also be avoided. What about something like I have a pen? It's not plated with gold or silver, but it's something which resembles exactly gold and silver. Some type of paint or something. What's the ruling on that? This is the thing. The believer has to protect his honor. So if I see my brother now walking around with a gold pen, what am I going to think? I'm going to think he's doing haram. Even though it's not haram because it's, it's not made from gold. It's something which uh, is similar to gold in, in its look. But you have to protect your honor, right? You shouldn't do something which is tashbir, which resembles that which is forbidden, okay? So we have to avoid that. But gold can be used in times of necessity. If there's a necessity, for example, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, in the hadith of Abi Dawood in Tirmidhi, one of the companions, he came to the Prophet ﷺ because his nose had been cut off in one of the battles. So the Prophet ﷺ advised him to take a nose made from gold, okay? To take a nose made from gold. So in, the t in times of necessity, gold and silver can be used for medical reasons if it needs to be used. Like there's a particular crown that you need, can only be made from silver or gold, something to that effect, right? Doctors and medics, they know better. So if it's a must, then it can be used. Tayyib. We're still talking about istimal, usage of gold and silver, which is absolutely forbidden for you to use, right? Except in the cases which I mentioned. What is the ruling on making wudu from a gold container or a silver container? The majority, they say it's valid. Okay? The overwhelming majority, they say it's valid. Why do they say it's valid? They say to you that this, the tahrim is where? The tahrim is in the usage of this gold and silver vessel. But the, making the wudu, using the water in that container has nothing to do with the conditions or the pillars of wudu itself. It doesn't affect the actual act of worship. So the act of worship is ajnabi, is foreign to the container. The actual acts of making wudu is foreign to the, to the container of gold, okay? So it doesn't affect the act of worship, yet you are sinful for having done so. You're sinful having gone against the Prophet Sallallahu command. Now this is different to making salah in Dar al maghsub for example, a, a, a property which has been stolen, okay? So they differentiate, because praying in a property which is stolen, your salah is not valid, okay? Because you're, you're using that property now, and because place is one of the conditions of prayer. And so this place now is haram, and the haram has literally affected the act of worship. But in making wudu from something which is haram, like gold or silver, it doesn't affect the act, affect the act of worship itself, but you are sinful for using it, for having made wudu. Tayyib, the Imam, he continues. He says, And to use them for tadbib, for embroidery on the vessels or anything, has the same ruling. So what is the ruling of embroidery with gold or silver? According to Imam, it's not allowed, right? The ruling of embroidery with gold and silver is the same. Except, إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ الضَّبَّةَ يَصِيرًا مِنْ, من الفضل. Unless it's a tiny bit of embroidery from silver. And add to this, لِلْحَاجَ For a need. Add in your notes, for a need. Because it doesn't say that in the book. What's the proof of this? The Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari is narrated, Anas radiyallahu anhu, he said, أَنَّ قَدَّهَا النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِنْكَسَرَ فَاتَّخَدَ النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَكَانَ شَعْبْ سِلْسَلَةً مِنْ فِضَّ that verily Anas radiallahu anhu narrates that the, one of the pots of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had broken. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam looked to where the crack was and he embroidered it with, he, he soldered it with a little bit of silver. Okay, so the hadith is a proof that in situations like that, where you have no other way to fix your item except by using a little bit of silver, then you can do so. You can use silver in that type of usage, okay? So now if I want to drink from that container that has just been fixed by the silver, what do I have to do? I have to avoid the area which has silver on it, right? I should turn it around and use the other side. So again, I don't fall into the prohibition of drinking or eating from the vessels which are made from gold and silver. طيب. So you're allowed to use it for need, for fixing the vessel, but you shouldn't drink from that particular part of the vessel. Turn it around and drink from the other part of the vessel. What about using something uh, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. What about using vessels which are not gold and silver, but they're just as expensive or more expensive than gold and silver? What's the ruling on that? The Imam he mentions, he says, It's allowed for use to use all other types of vessels and to take them, to leave them around the house, even if they are more expensive than gold and silver. Okay? 
all other vessels are allowed for you to use, except for those things which he's going to mention as exceptions, right? So you might have a type of iron, a type of metal, which is more expensive. Give me an example. Who? Platinum, Platinum right? Which is more expensive maybe than gold and silver. You're allowed to use that. But many of the ulama, they said, still, you should avoid using it. Why? What does Allah tell us? Kulu. Huh? It's lavish, right? Kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu. Eat and drink, but do not be of those who are extravagant, right? So the Muslim, he doesn't want to be somebody who is extravagant, wasteful in his money. But again, that's all relative. It depends upon how much money you're making. If you're making 100,000 riyals a month, then yeah, it's, it, comparative to your state of life, it's, it's not really extravagance. So it's all relative, right? Tayyib, what is the proof for what the Imam is saying? That you can use any other type of vessel, even if it's more expensive than gold and silver. The proof is... The qaida, the rule that the ulama they say, al aslu fil ashai al ibaha. Al aslu fil ashai al ibaha. The original ruling in things, in anything on the earth, is ibaha, is that it's allowed for you to use. Why? Because Allah says in Surah Al Baqarah, Khalaqa lakumma fil adi jamia. He created for you everything to use on the earth. So the origin in ruling is that anything on earth is allowed for us to use and benefit from. The exceptions are that which we find as prohibitions in the Quran and the Sunnah, okay, or the ijma of the Ummah. The Imam says, وَإِسْتَعْمَالْ أَوَانِ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ وَثِيَابُهُمْ مَا لَمْ تُعْلَمْ نَجَاسَتُهَا And it's allowed for you to use the, uh, the vessels of the Christians and the Jews, the Ahlul Kitab, as long as you do not know them to contain what? Impurity. Remember the hadith that we took two weeks ago, the hadith of Abi Tha'lab al-Khushani, where he said, we asked the Prophet of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Qultu ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, we are in the lands of the people of the book. They drink alcohol and they eat pig. What do you think about their vessels? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Da'uha ma wajadtum anha bud. Leave them alone as long as you find a replacement for them. Meaning, if you can find a replacement, leave them alone. فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُوا عَنْهَا بُدْ فَغْسِلُوهَا And if you do not find a replacement, then wash them. Meaning that you can use the vessels of Ahlul Kitab as long as they are not impure. Okay, if you don't know them to be impure, then the clothing of Ahlul Kitab and the vessels of Ahlul Kitab are allowed for you to use. In other narrations, it mentions even the mushrikeen. Because in Abi Dawood, we have the hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu, where he said, we used to make battle with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we used to get hold of the vessels and the drinking containers of the mushrikeen, the polytheists and we used to use them and benefit from them and the Prophet sallallahu wouldn't tell us off or wouldn't look down upon us for using that so even from amongst the mushrikeen, okay? So that means that anything which comes from the lands of China, the lands of India, the lands of the UK, in terms of vessels, in terms of clothing, don't tell people it's haram due to what it's made from. They're, actually, that's a different statement. In general, it's allowed to use, okay? Um, vessels and clothing which come from the Ahlul Kitab, unless you know it to be impure due to other reasons, okay? Meaning it can be impure due to the type of skin that it's made from. Like if it's made from crocodile skin, then according to the majority, something like crocodile skin, or snake skin, you're not allowed to use, okay? For other reasons. Taib, the Imam, he says, وَصُوفُ الْمَيْتَةِ وَشَعْرُهَا طَاهِرُ And the suf of the dead, the fur and the hair and the feathers of the dead animal is allowed for you to use. What does he mean here by dead animal? The ulama, they mean something when they say mayta. Ex excellent. Ahsan. They mean that animal which is not slaughtered. So that animal which has died due to its own reasoning or it died and it didn't manage to get slaughtered, okay, then it becomes impure due to that death, right? It becomes impure due to dying, not to having been slaughtered. So the animal in life, the sheep, is halal. It's pure for you to use, right, to eat. But if it dies without being slaughtered, it now becomes impure. You cannot use it, except for what the imam is saying, except for its suf, except for its hair, and it's uh, fur and something to that effect, okay? That you are allowed to use. Why do you think? So there's no life in the fur. There's no life. It doesn't have any feeling in the fur. There's no vessels of blood running around in the fur, right? So you're not considered as being alive. So it's an exception from the rule of becoming impure due to death, 
Okay? And the rule is that that which is pure in life, then it is pure in death in terms of its fur. That which is najis in life, like the pig and the dog, then it is najis in terms of also when it's dead. So the ruling again, that fur and, and hair of the animals, of the dead animal, is pure for you to use. And the Imam, he says, The Imam, he says, every jild, every skin, whether it is tanned, goes through the process of tanning, or not tanned, then it remains impure. Okay? This is known from the mufradat of the madhab al-Hanabila. The mufradat of the madhab means that it's from the peculiar opinions of the madhab. No other madhab holds its opinion except for the humblees. Okay? Not saying that it's wrong, but it's known as the peculiar... Pe peculiarity in opinion because it's only from the madhab of the Hanabila, which is that whether you tan the skin of a dead animal or not, okay, whether sacrificed or dead is not allowed for you to use. But they allow as an exception for it to be used after tanning in that which is dry. You can use it for carrying something which is dry. So they hold the opinion, our Imam and the rest of the Hanbali scholars, that tan the skin or don't tan it, it remains impure. But they say even so, even though we give that ruling, if you use it for carrying as a vessel something which is dry, like dates or something of that sort, then you can do so. Because the impurity won't transfer if it's dry. It transfers if it's wet, okay? So this is their thinking. And the proof for them saying that the tanning doesn't purify the skin of the animals is the following hadith, which is found uh, narrated by Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood and others. Where Abdullah ibn Qayyim, uh, رضي الله عنه he said كتب إلينا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل وفاته بشهر ألا تنتفئوا من الميتة بإهاب ولا عصب the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم wrote to us before his death by a month or so that do not benefit from the dead animal whether that be its skin or that which is under the skin in terms of the cells the fat etc okay do not benefit from the dead animal okay in terms of its skin or that which is under the skin in terms of its fat etc so what is their proof from this hadith that I just mentioned? They say, if you look at the wording of the hadith, Abdullah ibn Qayyim, what did he claim? He claimed that this was a month or so before the death of the Prophet Wasallam. So they say that now this hadith becomes nasikh, okay, for the other hadith which was before it. Because there are other hadith before it permitting the allowance of the using of the dead animals in terms of uh, using their skin if it's tanned. So their proof, the humbly scholars, our imam from them, is that this hadith shows that the letter was written by the Prophet, not written, sent by the Prophet Sallallahu a month or so before his death. So it was the latest of his fatawa. Okay? So it was a nasiq, nasiq and mansukh. It overrules that which is of the previous fatawa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi This is their opinion. Taib. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi and others, they say, no, you can purify the skin of the dead animal by tanning it. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, That if the ihab, if the skin is tanned, then it makes it pure. Okay, of the dead animal. The skin of, a, of uh, according to the, these scholars, who allow the using of uh, the skin of an animal, they say if it's sacrificed, the animal which is sacrificed, halal for you to sacrifice, then it doesn't need tanning. That skin doesn't need tanning. That's by ittifaq al-ulama. Okay, the majority of the ulama. What they're talking about here is the dead animal. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Ibn Taymiyyah, and those who agree with them, based upon this hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet ﷺ said, if the skin of the dead animal is tanned, then it becomes pure for you to use. Taib. So now we've mentioned two opinions. One of the Hanabila and one of the other scholars, right? Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he made jam between these two opinions. The one opinion which says you cannot use, based upon the hadith which I mentioned to you, and the other opinion which says you can use, right? Ibn Taymiyyah, he says something very interesting. He said the majority of the linguists, the linguists in Arabic language, they say that skin before tanning is called ihab. So where the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا تنتفئوا من الميتة بإهاب Do not use the ihab of the dead animal. Ibn Taymiyyah, he says before tanning, it's called ihab. This is according to the majority of the linguists. But after tanning, it's called jild or other names. It's known as skin. So what the Prophet ﷺ, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, was saying is that you cannot use the skin before tanning. In any case, all of this extra speech, what I want you to concentrate is the opinion of the Imam. He says what? What's his opinion, the Imam's opinion? You are not allowed to use 
the skin of the dead animals whether you tan them or you do not tan them okay this is the opinion of our imam he says likewise takes the same ruling the bones of the dead animal what's the ruling of the bones of dead animals somebody says to you can i use a comb made from the bones of a sheep or the bones of whatever what is the ruling you're going to tell them based upon the imam you cannot use it it's impermissible right and why do you think the imam he reaches this conclusion you mentioned something similar to it before Be again due to the life cells it's alive right it, it had life in it before so it became impure due to death and the opinion from this is in the quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions surah al yasin and who is going to give life to the bones right they say the non-muslims say and Allah is quoting them, who is going to give life to the bones once they have become dust? So if you give life to the bones, meaning that the bones, they have life in them, right? So if they have life in them, they became impure due to death. This is the wajhu dolala. This is how the evidence is extrapolated from this ayah. So the bones also of dead animals are not allowed to be used. That's the opinion of who? Our imam and those who agree with him. Others like Abu Hanifa and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, may Allah have mercy upon them all, all of these scholars and imams of fiqh and hadith, etc. They say in the hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا حُرِمَ مِنَ الْمَيْتَةِ أَكْلُهَا Okay, that verily that which is prohibited from the dead is to eat it. So they say that the Prophet sallallahu only prohibited eating from the dead animals. He didn't prohibit the use of the skin or the use of the bones, etc. Okay. So according to Ibn Taymiyyah and Abu Hanifa, you can use it. But our Imam, no. The Imam, he carries on and he says, And every dead is impure. Okay? So you find a dead animal, we know it's that impure. Okay? You find a dead Muslim, the ruling is not impure. Okay? Because the Imam, he gives an exception now. He says, He said, except for the son of Adam. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Verily, we have given honor to the son of Adam. We have given him a status. So he doesn't become impure. طيب, what about the hadith where it says, إِنَّ المش... uh, The ayah in the Quran, Surah Tawbah, إِنَّ الْمُشْرِكُونَ النَّجِسِ Verily, the polytheists, they are impure. It's not physical, it's intangible impurity. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, ma'nawi, okay? It's intangible impurity this is referring to. The spiritual impurity. And of course, we have also the statement of Ibn Abbas in, in, in Bukhari, where he said, Inna al Muslim la yanjus hayy wa la mayyitan. Hayyan wa la mayyitan. Verily, the believer does not become impure, whether alive or dead. So that means that you can do the things like, if permission is given, you can have body transplants. You can have from the uh, believer that which is uh, required for you to use if permission is given by his family, because you are not accepting something into your body which is impure. Tayyib. So he said, all of the dead are impure, and then he gave the exception, except of the sons of Adam. And he also says, And also the dead of the sea, which do not live except in the sea. Okay? Because in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ was asked, Can we make wudu from the water of the sea? The Prophet ﷺ said, It is pure in its water, and for you is allowed, it's dead. Okay? So the dead is halal of the sea for you to benefit from. Tayyib. Of course, there are some exceptions that we will take later on if we ever reach that in the book of At'imah, in the book of foods, etc. Uh, generally, the exceptions are based upon things like crocodiles. Uh, some of them say sea snakes. Uh, some of them say, uh, of course, frogs and a few other things. Tayyib. The Imam he says, وَمَا لَا نَفْسِ لَهُ سَائِلَ إِذَا, إذا لَمْ يَكُنْ مُتَوَلِّدًا مِنَ النَّجَاسَاتِ And also allowed for you, for the dead, from the dead, that which is not considered impure. The first of the dead which was not considered impure was the sons of Adam. The second of them, that which lives only in the sea, right? Now the third of them, the Imam is mentioning, that which doesn't have flowing blood in them, okay? Right? That thing which is small like the mosquito like the fly which doesn't have flowing blood in it remains pure what's the proof the proof is the hadith in where the prophet sallallahu mentioned in bukhari if the fly falls into the vessel of one of you then 
push it down into the water, all of it. Okay, drown it. For verily, in one of its wings is a cure, and in the other is the disease. Okay? In one of the wings of the mosquito or the fly is a cure, in the other wing is the, is the disease. So where's the proof from here to say that the thing which doesn't have flowing blood is pure? From the hadith. What did the Prophet tell us? If the fly falls into the vessel of one of you, then drown it basically dip it into the water because verily one of the wings contains the disease and the other contains the cure would the prophet sallallahu tell you to dip something najis into your water no impossible right najis is you need to avoid it so the fact that it's not najis is proven by the fact that the prophet sallallahu said dip it into your water okay so this proves that something which doesn't have flowing blood okay is pure if it dies Muhammad just add to that quickly sorry um, so the ulama, they add to these other creatures like cockroaches and things like that. They do not have flowing blood, okay? But the imam, he mentioned, as long as it's not mutawallad min najasat okay? As long as it's not brought up, it's not nourished from impurities. If it's nourished and it ca- comes from impurities, like you have some types of cockroaches that come from filth and they live upon filth, then this will be najis due to what it's nourished upon and due to the essence of the creature, Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Fly, fly may sit upon some filth, but it's not nourished from filth generally. It's not the, all that it does. It's not its general habitat. Okay? You give it clean honey, it's going to come to your honey. Yeah? Some nice kebabs, it will come to your nice kebabs. It won't always choose to go to the dustbin. Taib shabab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you immensely. If you have any corrections or questions, feel free, inshallah. That which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any mistakes and shortcomings from myself and shaitan.